The scene is the quiet garden of an Irish convent in the days when the memory of St. Patrick was still as green as Ireland's fields. On the right, the wall of the convent rises, solid and round arch, and throwing forward a single broad flight of stairs, which leads up to the heavy brass-studded oak door. The window to the right of the door is narrow and stained red with a heavy carmen cross. A long, broad, covered walk runs across the rear of the convent garden, and through its heavy stone arches, one can look out into the orchard beyond. The wall which bounds the orchard extends itself along the left of the garden, where it is broken by a double door gate, once more of brass studded wood, its beautifully wrought hinges spreading like an exposed roof over the firm wood. In the center of the garden rises a tall yew tree, which brushes on one side the second story of the convent, and on the other, flings a few venturesome branches over the garden wall. In its shade stand a number of plain chairs with woven seats and a small but heavy round table. Several rather small half-finished tapestries lie on the table, dropped as if in obedience to a sudden bell. A distaff covered with wool rests on the chair. These evident signs of feminine handicraft, not more than the carefully trimmed ivy that clings to the yew and the climb of roses beneath the convent window, mark this as the abode of women. The beautifully illumined parchment gospels on the table mark them for religious women. There is a moment of deep, peaceful silence, and then a gong within the convent rings out a solemn, resonant note, which is enveloped rather than lost in the sound of a choir of women's voices chanting the Magnificat. Then the door of the convent swings gently open. A nun, habited in white lamb's wool, with a veil of lighter material draped from her forehead, stands for a moment, hesitating in the doorway. Her face is lifted gratefully to the fresh wind from the garden. Then turning, she closes the door and moves swiftly down the low stairs, her hands slightly extended before her. At the foot of the steps, she veers to the right and stoops to gather in her hands the full flowers of the climber roses. She lays them for a moment against her young, fresh cheek. Then with the same gliding motion, one hand still before her, palm downward and fingers slightly spread, she crosses to the table, where she pauses once more. Lightly, her hand moves over the tapestries, touches the Gospels reverently, and then from the chair, picks up her distaff. With an instinctive grace of carriage, she seats herself in one of the chairs, and her fingers mechanically busy themselves she is facing out now, and one can see that hers is a fair, vibrant young face, whose dark, arching eyebrows contrast almost vividly with the calm whiteness of her complexion, and whose small red lips are parted in an expectant smile. But the eyes that look out from the vital face are fixed and expressionless, for the soul of the nun is closed in a cell of Perpetual darkness. She is blind. I'm glad you've come. 
Mother Bridget. How did you know it was odd? As if you could hide your presence from me. When you came, the air seemed warmer and more tender. I could feel the roses flinging handfuls of scent to welcome you. And the sweetness of your smile wings its way straight to my heart. Yet men call you blind. And I call them blind. My eyes are closed, but my soul sees. Their eyes can see, but their souls are closed to light. Come, mother dear, tell me all the news. First of all, a dear sister Dara, blessed with the sight of blindness, is to take her vows tomorrow. Really? Who found such a poor, weak girl worthy of that? The dear Christ who loves the poor and the weak, and sister Bridget who loves the girl. Oh, I'm happy, blissfully happy. Tomorrow is the day of my espousal to the dear Christ. I dreamt of it by days and wept by nights for fear that it might not come. And then? Our saintly chaplain wept tears of joy when he held the dear Jesus in his hands this morning. Is that strange? Talk to me of Mass. Fancy the altar calm, white, and stately, yet hiding in its crevices the sweetest flowers of our garden. Fancy the priest standing there in his long, enveloping vestments, brought in the purest linen by your hands, Dara, and the hands of the nuns, our sisters, into the triumphant symbols of our redemption. Fancy the moment when, like the moon or the high peaks of the mountains, the priest raises the host, and looking upward, we see God with us. That, Dara, is Mass. Oh, Mother, you see less than your blind Dara. Listen, I knelt at Mass and my soul saw a host of angels swinging vast censers filled with the quintessence of the rose, the hyacinth, and the jasmine. I saw tiny cherubs elbowing each other in their eagerness to be near the Christ who was to come, and seraphs holding illumined scrolls from which they were to chant the praises of their love. I saw a long road paved with gold and flecked with stardust, leading upward toward gates of beaten brass. Then the gates swung wide and down the long road he glided, his hands outstretched to me, his eyes gazing into the depths of my soul. No flowers, no priest, no concealing host shrouded him from my vision and looked straight up into the sweet face of Christ. That, Mother dear, is Mass. You see the best of us all. But, Mother dear, more news. The climber roses here under the window are in bloom. I know. They called out to me and kissed me when I entered the garden. Their perfume must be like the scent of his breath. Sister Columba has more than half finished her tapestry. The tapestry of Our Lady with Jesus in the manger? Yes, it is exquisite. The background is red. Red is the color of his love. Our Lady's mantle is blue. Blue is the color of her thoughts. The child is wrapped in the purest white. White is the color of his beloved soul. You have never seen a color. How can you know all this? They tell me the world is very beautiful, Mother dear. So beautiful that men fall in love with it and forget him who made it. Is this true? God pity us, yes. Then perhaps had I seen colors, I should know them for themselves and not for what they mean to me now. I cannot see their beauty, but I can see instead the beauty of him who made them. They are but poor images of his loveliness and now the image can never distract me from him they reflect. I love the touch of wool. It is like his tender mercy. I love the sighing of the wind as it stirs the trees. It is like his voice sighing over sinners. The rushing waters as they hurl themselves over the cataract shout to me of his power. I love women because they have his gentleness. I love men because he was a man. But mother, more news. To said the king of Leinster is passing this way. Truly? They say he is looking for a bride amongst the maidens of Ireland. Is he tall and handsome as a king should be? He is disguised as a bard. 
Yet even that could not hide his kingliness. I wish I were a queen. Why, Dora? Because then I could lay a crown at the feet of my Jesus tomorrow. Mother dear, may I whisper a secret? As you would to your own soul. I do not mind being blind. I know that I am happier that way. But for his sake, for the sake of Jesus, just think, Mother, I have not even a perfect gift for him tomorrow. Only a poor maid to think a blind girl. The lamb I have to offer should be without spot. But your soul is spotless. And Jesus loves souls. But just think how perfect a gift of Christ should be, Mother. Think how beautiful his virgin spouse should seem. And though my soul sees, my body is maimed, blind. I never heard you speak like this before. I never felt this way till the day of my consecration came near. Yes, sister. A wandering bard is at the gate, wishes hospitality. Bid him enter. Bring him into the garden. Yes. Was it wrong for me to complain? I was thinking only of him, not of myself. Would you like your sight for, for tomorrow for him, that I may meet my lover as a bride without blemish? Yes. Then, if it be God's holy will, see. Mother, mother, I see. I see, oh, how beautiful it all is. I could not have dreamed it would all be like this. Are those my roses? They burn into my soul like a leaping flame. And the soft leaves of the yew rest upon my soul like the sound of gently crooning harps. Mother, that tremendous power up there that won't let me look on it. Is that the sun? It is. It's like God. It is like God, but think how pitifully weak it all is compared to him who made it. It is too, too beautiful. I can think of nothing else. Oh, I could not have dreamed it would all be so fair. Can he surpass all this? Tomorrow I 
make my vows. You are very young. Can one offer herself too soon to him? Not if one loves her life, do you? Oh, with all my heart. Ah, uh, but what about the great and beautiful world beyond these walls? Don't you love that? That I have never seen. Until the day I was blind. Until today? Today she touched, she kissed my eyes, and I see. So you've never seen the beautiful world out there that drips with colors as the trees drip with water after an evening storm. You've never seen the trusting eyes of children, the beautiful smile of a woman, and the curving grace of a man's arm. <laughs> you've never seen the how you never felt the power that rushes through your heart when your eyes glide across the stark lines of sun gilded spears. You have never felt the warmth of, that comes into you when gold of cloth sweeps over inlaid floors. You have never known the power, the beauty, the skill of man. Until today I saw but Christ. Oh, I love it all. Every rushing brook, every tree, every flower, the mountain heads that thrust their audacious heads into the very heavens. Every starlight flower that makes every meadow another sky. The supple hands and curving lips of women the rippling muscles and chain-like sinews of man. And do you love Christ? Yes, but him I never saw. Why then have you eyes? Surely all this power, this splendor, must make you see him who made them. It's all so beautiful. I cannot fathom the tiniest gem, the smallest flower. The creator is hidden in his creation? Perhaps. And yet, until today, I saw Christ so clearly. Until today, you were blind. You are fair, very fair. Beyond these walls is a world languishing for eyes to drink in its beauty and drink deep of it. For every flower in this garden, there are a million fairer blossoms that will bend to meet you when they come. Not one new tree, but palisades of new trees that shelter with their branches avenues of the tenderest green that lead to the king himself. The sun here is fair. There it is a joyous monarch, flinging its largesses to be caught up in silver and gold, in soft white hands and glistening eyes. Of what avail you sight here? Come with me and I will lead you down the path at the end of which gleams a waiting throne. Excuse me, Sir Minstrel, I have been over long. We have spread a board for you. I thank you. Sister Columba will serve you. I will not be long. The beauty of your garden has captivated my heart. Mother dear, why, Dara, are those tears in your eyes? I never yet saw them, whilst they could not see. Can they see now, Mother? Tell me what you mean. Before my eyes, Mother, has risen a veil. Wonderful, beautiful veil woven of sunlight, rose red, the glint of eyes that look their praise. Beyond that veil lies something that until then I saw, and now I see only the veil. Beyond that veil lies Christ, but him I no longer see. Oh, my dear daughter. No, Mother, I am blind with beauty. My eyes are bound with the splendor of earth and the loveliness of man. Mother, give me back my sight. But the spotless victim for tomorrow. Spotless victim is the victim that you see. And now I am blind. Oh, Dara, I have been a foolish old woman. If it be the sight of God, see, as you saw before. Yeah.